As most of us know, according to most space enthusiasts, this is man's next major destination. But even though this is a relatively close planet, it's still, at its closest approach, 33.9 million miles or 54.6 million kilometers, or, unbelievably, 130 times further away than the distance from the Earth to the Moon. How the hell are we supposed to traverse that kind of distance? I mean, just getting to the Moon is a tremendous undertaking. To the casual observer, getting to Mars would seem absolutely impossible. And yet, as most of us know, there are two major solutions that have been proposed. But come on, everybody knows that this is the best solution. I mean, it's visionary and innovative and completely reusable. It's capable of carrying a hundred tons or a hundred individuals to the red planet. It's a completely superior mode of transport. And if you don't agree with that, you're a complete idiot. Then again, everybody also knows that the manufacturer of your precious innovative ship has yet to put a single human being into orbit, whereas we've put people to the moon, we've been putting people into space for decades, and we are going to be using tried and true technology to get mankind to the red planet. So if you don't agree with our point of view, you're a complete idiot. But what nobody seems to be asking is, what happens if the United States fails to get us to the red planet by itself? Because pretty much that's what we're saying, right? SLS is a NASA project being pretty much put together by a 100% American corporation, Boeing, as much as I despise them, and SpaceX is also an American corporation. And that's it. We're putting all of our faith in this one governmental American institution and this one American company. What happens if neither of them succeed? The SLS could very well be canceled or defunded. It's already billions of dollars over budget. And the Starship, as much as we believe in SpaceX, it's a company. And companies fail. Companies do not have unlimited resources. Anything could happen to Elon Musk, God forbid, tomorrow. What happens if both of these solutions fail? Just for sake of argument, is that it? Are our plans to go to the Red Planet completely done if we can no longer use the SLS or the Starship? Welcome to yet another installment of The Angry Astronaut. I hope that everyone is doing well in the middle of this crisis that's wreaking complete havoc in my home country of the United States. I hope most of you reside in other places where things are less extreme. But I didn't want to talk about the event as we're kind of forced to here at YouTube. Nor actually did I really want to talk about the various things that might prevent us from having the SLS or the Starship become successful projects. Didn't want to bring that up at all, really. I just wanted to talk about alternatives. Because there were actually many alternatives postulated at one time in the history of 
space enthusiasts before we had these super rocket ideas. Now, unsurprisingly, this whole issue has me kind of pissed off. I mean, we're acting as if super rockets are the only solution, and we've completely forgotten about another solution. I mean, the whole reason that you need a super rocket is to escape Earth's gravity well. What if you could bypass the gravity well altogether? Well, one way to do that is through the use of something called a space elevator. A lot of you may be familiar with that concept, others may not. It's The basic idea is a very, very slender tether attached to a platform in orbit, and then you have a cable car transport whatever cargo or passengers you need up to orbit. The drawback with the space elevator is the tether itself. Because of the various issues with the Earth, from its atmosphere, to the rotation, to the gravity, we do not currently possess technology to manufacture a tether that will be strong enough to do the job. However, what if we had a space elevator orbiting the moon? Now, the idea of a space elevator was postulated decades ago, but one based on Earth would just have too many problems. Aside from the ones I've already mentioned, it would be a menace to air traffic, vulnerable to terrorist attack, and could also be damaged by a variety of space junk. But what would the benefit of a space elevator based on the moon be? Well, firstly, if you don't have to actually land on the moon, it's a lot easier to make the trip. And secondly, if you don't have to actually get all the way to the moon, it's a lot easier to make the trip. So a wider variety of rockets could actually reach a lunar elevator. So once these rockets delivered their cargo to the elevator, cable cars driven by ion engines or electromagnetic drives could take cargo or passengers to and from the lunar surface. The cable itself could be manufactured out of existing carbon fibers or a variety of other kinds of materials and would be very lightweight and wouldn't have to deal with the other drawbacks that an earthbound space elevator cable would have to. Now the cable would be connected to a small space station located as what's called Lagrange Point 1 or essentially a very stable orbital location where the Earth and Moon's gravity cancel each other out, basically a lunar parking spot, and it would act as a counterweight. And you wouldn't be restricted to one location on the lunar surface either. One space station could be tethered to multiple locations on the equator or at the poles where we think there's a substantial amount of water ice. But what kind of space station could we use? Well, I think that one is pretty easy for all of you to guess. My personal favorite project, the Lunar Gateway. Now in order for the Gateway to do this, we would have to change its orbit from a rectilinear halo pattern to one that adheres to a Lagrange point one, but that was one of the proposed orbits for the Gateway anyway. So once a rocket's payload arrives at Lagrange Point 1, it could be grappled by the Canadarm, much as it currently is on the ISS, and then either transferred to the space station or transferred to the lunar space elevator and sent to the lunar surface aboard a cable car. It eliminates the entire need for landers or all the complications of landing on the moon or taking off from the moon. I mean, it's a perfect solution. Now, before you start rattling off in the comments about how the Gateway has been canceled and the idea sucks and SpaceX is much better, etc., etc., I would have you remember that a couple of weeks ago I released a video that proposed the notion of using SpaceX to resupply the Gateway to extend the length of lunar missions. And today, today, SpaceX was awarded a contract by NASA to resupply the Lunar Gateway using a vessel called the Dragon XL and the Falcon Heavy. Now, I don't have an inside line to Elon Musk or anything along those lines, but 
I have to admit, I was really shocked when I saw that news. But I'm not making this up, guys. SpaceX was awarded that contract today to resupply the Lunar Gateway with the Dragon XL. Now, if Elon Musk didn't believe in the Gateway and didn't think that it was going to happen, why would he accept such a contract in any event? All of that having been said, there are of course a number of other important questions about a lunar space elevator. So, of course, there's a number of questions that I'm sure need to be answered as far as this whole idea is concerned. First of all, cost. Well, believe it or not, the upper level of cost estimates for a space elevator to Lagrange Point 1 out to the Lunar Gateway runs at less than a billion dollars, or less than a twentieth of what we have spent so far on the SLS development, and we don't even have a prototype yet. So, cost, not too big of a deal, even if you have to set up several strands going to the lunar surface, both the poles and the equator, pretty much wherever you want to go. How about getting the cables to the lunar surface in the first place? Well, that's not too difficult either. Since the cables are so slender, you can deliver them using tiny robotic landers, and those are both inexpensive and easy to deploy compared to trying to land on the moon with a human crew. What about mass? Well, the entire tether, plus quite a number of cable cars, could be delivered by a single Falcon Heavy. So the entire setup, at least to get the process started, delivered by one Falcon Heavy. And once you have the elevator in place, you can not only send cargo and crew to the surface for short expeditions, but you can also send down 3D printers, robotic assembly units, things that are required in order to start the beginnings of a lunar base. And you can do all of this without having to send down expensive, non-reusable landers or having to develop reusable landers and risk losing those. There would be no atmosphere to contend with, Nothing that might cut the cable aside from perhaps a passing meteoroid. That is one danger and one drawback to this setup. But one way to avoid that is to have the cable set up in a hundred segments, each one having its own small cable car attached. So if a segment gets cut out, the cable car can reattach it and repair it in short order. And, amazingly enough, from the lunar gateway to the lunar surface, the total transfer time on a cable car would range anywhere from a day for a long journey to one of the poles to just a couple of hours down to the equator. I mean, there's so many advantages to this system. What's not to like? And this is what has me pissed off. Because even though I'm a big fan of the Starship, it is tragic that there are other methods using ex existing technologies and science that we already understand and a base that we're planning to build anyway. We could start exploring and establishing a permanent presence on the moon now using rockets that we already have or rockets that we're planning to build in the very near future, like the new Glenn. Why are we not exploring these options and focusing exclusively on these super rockets? But what does this have to do with getting us to Mars? Well, that'll have to wait till my next episode. So until then, stay safe, stay well, and stay angry about space. <laughs>